Um, and remember, I have had to limit a lot of our discussion. Um, so, don't think that I'm giving you an exhaustive list of, of everything. So, the exile is a period of um, Israelite history from uh, Babylon's destruction of Jerusalem in uh, 586 until their return in the 500s. And uh, then that takes us to the intertestamental period and all that stuff. So, um, Second Kings 25, 27 through 30, says, and in, excuse me, and in the 30, 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Um, and then in verse 30, and, and for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. Now, uh, this uh, is another thing that we can definitely have proof of we uh we have something called the ration tablets and that actually that that has the different kings that he had um and and how what he gave them and whatnot and actually mentioned specifically is jehoiakim of judah um so this is just one of the most little interesting things um jeremiah 43 7 And they came into the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they arrived at uh, Tapanes. Now, we know, the modern world, uh, that there was an Egy a Jewish presence in Egypt. So this just tells us where that Jewish presence came from. Uh, apparently there were three main groups of where the Jews went after the exile. There was a group that developed in Egypt, which is very well documented. This is something that is just known. Uh, there was a group that was actually left in Judah. And sometimes people think that all the all the Israelites were moved out of Judah. This is just not true. Uh, there were a lot of poor people that were left um, that were that grew crops and whatnot uh, that then fed into the Babylon Empire. Um, well, and then the Persian Empire. So the, there was actually a, a pretty good population. It just wasn't enough to really do anything. Basically, farmers, um, rural communities. Um, and then the third group of Israelites was in Babylon, um, in different areas there. And some of them even liked living there, and so they just kind of stayed. Uh, the wealthiest and the smartest and uh, the craftsmen and those kinds of things, they were, they were in Babylon. And this is another thing that is very well documented. They were not the only group of people to have this. Babylon went places, and would, they would take the skilled workmen, the masters of the craft, you know, the, the different musicians, the different wealthy people, they would take them and just kind of leave uh, a very shell group, or sometimes they wouldn't even leave a shell group, they would just kind of move another group in. Um, so there's that. Uh, there is some parts in the book of Daniel, um, which are in Aramaic, which seem to imply that it's credible. Because, once again, this would seem to imply that he's quoting actual texts from the Babylonian Empire. Hence why there's Aramaic there. Um, obviously, this could have been added later, but the question becomes, why would they do that? Let's just add it in another language, just for poos and giggles. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't really it doesn't seem like something they would do. Um, it's very interesting. Assyrian and Babylonian Empire, we have lots of stuff on that. I mean, you, you can read book after book, guys. Okay. Persian Empire, things get a little bit more limited, uh, it, which is an odd thing because the Persian Empire was kind of a big deal. Um, they lasted for hundreds, hundreds of years. They went up against Greece, and they had their wars that went on for a long time. Uh, finally, uh, with you know Alexander the Great, 
finally getting the upper hand, um, who was actually Macedonian, but whatever. Um, and so we have all this, all this history, and it's just boop, not really that strong, not really that as much resources as you as you think. Whereas the Babylonian Empire, which gives lots of data, only existed for like. 70 or something years. I mean, it really wasn't that long. And the Syrian Empire, which lasted, you know, a, a, a few hundred. Well, there's technically the old Babylonian and old Assyrian Empire, but those are basically like two different worlds, um, which lasted a couple hundred years and still, you know, lots there, but interesting. So, uh, now I, I don't want to mislead you. We, The modern world does have good access to Persian history. It's just not as in-depth as you'd suspect. Um, so, it was, Israel was not the only one that Persia allowed to renew their religion. This is this is something that is well known. Persia, their ta Babylon, Babylon and Assyria's tactic was this: we will conquer you, discredit your god, you know, and then take the symbols of your god into our shrines so that so that we can parade it before our god to show how much mightier we are than you and how much mightier uh, Marduk, for instance, of Babylon is of, of your god. Well, Persia had a complete different mindset. Their mindset was this. People are more loyal if instead of erasing their identity, you give them something. So they had this, this idea. They, they went in and they said, you know what? You can go back and build your temple. You can go back and build your temple. And Persia gave them this kind of idea. I am giving uh, respect to your god. Uh, they did this with, I mean, most every god. They were kind of like god whores. It's not like they were bound to one god. They they would they would do whatever, um, very synchronistic, uh, and so it shouldn't surprise us that that the king of Persia allowed Israel to go back to their land and build the temple. That shouldn't be something that really causes that much like well, oh, because he was allowing everybody to do it. Um, Daniel four twenty five. There are a few things in Daniel that are criticized. Um, I know I've talked about a few of them a couple times, but. It's worth mentioning some of them again, uh, just because, I mean, we're going through archaeology. Why why skip it? Daniel 4.25 says this, that you shall be driven. Uh, he, Daniel is talking to um, Nebuchadnezzar. This is the interpretation, O king, in verse 24. It is a decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord the king. That you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. Now, people disagree a lot about how much time this was. Um, the issue being that Daniel never... Daniel just has a kind of confused way of saying stuff like he won't ever just say it like he'll say 70 weeks of seven or you know something like that and it's like you can't ever just say so it's kind of people go back and forth as to how much time actually elapsed i don't know seven years 17 years i i don't know when <laughs> he just said seven spans of time i don't know what that means um so that that's not really something that that is worth getting into today because i mean it honestly it just sounds like hundred different views. Um, but here's the thing. There is actually very little um, evidence of Nebuchadnezzar's later, the, la the latter part of Nebuchadnezzar's life. Now, this isn't proof because it's just silence, but it would fit very nicely there. Um, you know, uh, da Daniel says, okay, you're going to become kind of like crazy. You're just going to be living like a crazy animal. And then Huh, imagine that. Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of his life, he just kind of drops off the picture, and we don't have much about the end of his life. So what happened? Well, Daniel's little thing here might might very well bridge that gap. But so far, as far as I'm aware, the only idea we have of what actually happened in the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life is what Daniel says happened. So, um, okay. There are a few things that people say when it comes to the prophecies of this time and before and after. Um, so let me just kind of address two of those. Daniel must be ignored because it contains prophecy. In other words, because Daniel is a book that contains so-called prophecy, 
um, or you know whatever, regardless of whether it's written after the fact or before the fact or whatever, because it contains that as an element in it, it you, you can't really believe it. It's not really trustworthy. But the problem is just because something contains prophecy doesn't disprove the events or the existence of the prophecy. Basically, you can't say that prophecy doesn't exist just because you say that prophecy doesn't exist. So I mean, like, there's there's an issue there. And then, just because um, the book claims prophecy doesn't mean that the event didn't happen. Okay, like, let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, last year, I say, hey, there's going to be a virus, and it's going to it, it's going to scare the the entire globe is going to become panicked. It just the whole world will be changed. And so then it happens this year, and you say. Uh, I can't trust what Michael wrote last year because it was a prophecy. That doesn't discredit the actual event of happening. COVID did actually happen, regardless of whether there was a prophecy involved or not. So, once again, to ignore the entire book of Daniel just because it contains prophecy is short-sighted, unhistorical, and just nonsensical. So an another, another kind of aha that people bring up, the prophecies were written after the fact. Well, first off, that's not proven, but then... Let's say some of them were. I'm just going to say we're going to take a very liberal approach here. Some of the prophecies were written after the fact. Just roll with me on this, okay? What about the ones fulfilled after the book was written? At least some of the some of the prophecies were, were fulfilled afterwards. Like, for instance, Daniel gives a very descriptive um, uh, account of what's going to happen between the exiles returning to Jerusalem and the return of Jesus. It's a it's a spirit it's a it's a period of a couple hundred years, and he tells very precisely what's going to happen. He talks about the kings of the north and the south, which is um, as Alexander the Great came through, um, he pretty much conquered the world. He got to at the, at the other side of Persia, and he was going into India, and his troops said, "Look, we're done. We're done. Like we're just not going to keep going to the ends of the earth. We're over. This is it." And then Alexander the Great dies very suddenly, and he had no successors. So his generals just kind of go, okay, I'm going to take that, you're going to take that. And this creates some different um, kingdoms, the Seleucid Empire, for instance, uh, and here we have the two generals being becoming the king of the north and the king of the south, and they keep fighting over, over Israel. And all of that happens exactly like the book of Daniel says. And so then it talks about someone who's going to end the, feet, the, the the sacrifices. So then Jesus comes and does away with the sacrifices. That happened after we have the documented the book of Daniel being written. So that means at least one of the prophecies, at least, very, bare minimum, um, was proven after the book was written. Now there are some prophecies in Daniel that seem to be talking, I fully believe, about the future that is still yet to come. This is 2,000, 2,500 years after the book was written. So it's like you're, you're kind of hard-pressed to say that the prophecies were written after the fact when at least some of them are written. I mean, some of them came, happened after. So it's like, well, you're kind of – if you're going to make an outrageous claim like that, you really need to back it up with something. You need to prove without, without any shadow of a doubt that he was not talking about – the two generals and their kingdoms that spawned from them fighting back and forth. Because it fits historically, it fits great. So you need to prove something else. What else was Daniel talking about? But unless you want to take the Nostradamus way out. Oh, well, it's like Nostradamus. Here's the thing. If you read his prophecies, they don't really make sense. Um, they're kind of just vague, and they could be attributed to anything. And then any time that something even remotely resembles it, they'll say, Aha! But this is some, the book of Daniel was something that gave clarity before, and they were looking forward to the event having happened. Well, with Nostradamus, that's not the case. With Nostradamus, after the events took place, they say, this kind of looks like his prophecy here. And the, see what I mean? It's just like com two completely different realms. So to equate Daniel to Nostradamus is like, it just doesn't fit. And you need to have some more verified proof before you make such outlandish claims. Uh, Daniel 5, 1 through 2 says King Bel uh, Belshazzar can you turn on those three lights please? King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand 
Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessel of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be, um, be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Um, so in this, people have said, aha, this is proof that it's not accurate because he calls Nebuchadnezzar his father. He's not. Well, I find that very funny because up until a few years ago, they didn't even they couldn't even prove that Belshazzar even existed. But then they were so quick to say that Daniel, the book of Daniel, was inaccurate. Even when Bel even when the book of Daniel told us that there was a guy named Belshazzar who was in who was in charge here, that no other sort. You see what I mean? Like, so the Bible gave us details about somebody. And because you didn't even know that that person existed, when you finally did know that he existed, you now discredit it because, like, what? That doesn't even make sense. So when you look at how words are used um, and during different times and whatnot, father, as I've, I've said this countless times, father can be translated more as predecessor, founder, um, ancestor. It's just – it's obviously talking about – um, the person who was more noteworthy. Belshazzar's actual father was just not overly... Um, let's say, for instance, Abraham Lincoln was my was my forefather. Okay, And so uh, we're talking about me, and I say that my father Abraham Lincoln did. Now, why would I reference back to him? Because he was someone noteworthy in my family line. So I mean, so that doesn't say that this is inaccurate. Again, um, if I, for some reason, Dan, the Book of Daniel has a lot more people trying to disprove it than other books, like Hosea. Who cares? We don't care if that one's accurate. Micah. Oh, we don't really care. Jeremiah. Oh yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Isaiah. Well, maybe a little bit, but then you get to Daniel, and it's like, no, we have to prove this book is false. And it's like, okay, whatever. It's like. Uh around here when I'm talking to some of the older people in Southern Town, I always refer to my grandfather because they all knew him. Yeah. You know, right. so if they're like, Where are you from? you know, I tell them my grandfather. Right. Yeah, that that's totally totally fits. Especially since in context Nebuchadnezzar is the one who destroyed Jerusalem. Yeah. So if you're talking about divine retribution it makes more sense to talk about the one who brought divine re retribution. Whatever. Uh, five sixteen says this um, if I can find it. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you should be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Why does he say third? Well, see, this is kind of another one of those things that give, gives us proof that the person who was writing really actually knew what they were writing about. Um, King Belshazzar was not actually the top dog. His father was. But his father was kind of a loony. Um, of his 17 years that he reigned, he spent 10 of it living out in the desert, worshipping the moon god. Just not really taking care of anything, just kind of out there living in the desert. So King Belshazzar kind of took the reins, but he was still second in command. Um, and uh, so then... Here he is talking to Daniel, and he says, I will make you third in the kingdom, because I can't make you first, and I can't make you second, but I can make you third. <laughs> uh, okay, so whoop. so there's that. Um, that's, once again, proving that it's accurate, not inaccurate. In 531, it says this. Uh, well, I'll start in 30. That very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Now, here's the problem. Darius didn't conquer Babylon. Cyrus II did. And then was Cambyses II, and then Darius. So there's a little bit of a problem there. Now, traditionally, there's going to be two, pe two ways that people explain it. They're going to say that Darius is a title for Sarah, Cyrus. That is one of his names. Now, I think that doesn't really make sense, but whatever. Um, I think that he would have been more likely to refer to him by the name that everybody already knew, Cyrus. Especially since that, that would have been given the account much more rely, reliability. Oh, it's Cyrus. Um, another idea that people throw around quite a lot is that Darius is Cyrus's governor, that when Cyrus came through and took over and Persia now controls Babylon, that uh, he places Darius in charge as the governor while he goes out and conquers more. 
Okay. Uh, that has a little bit more credibility to it. That, that seems like something that might actually happen. Uh, but I think my solution is a lot more simple. And you don't have to do so much like trying to make it fit. It just If you just read it for what it is, it makes more sense. You don't have to agree with me. It doesn't matter. Um, it's possibly just skipping down the line. That very night, Belshazzar the King, Chaldean king was killed. Then end of the story. Now, moving on. Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. It's not necessarily saying he immediately received it. It's just skipping the other kings. And then if you get to chapter 6, verse 1, it makes sense why he would skip Cyrus and Cambyses. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120... See what I mean? Because the, this next story he's going to involves Darius. So why would you mention Cyrus if he has nothing to do with the story? And then he talks about Daniel in the lion's den, which has to do with who? Darius. Cy that wasn't Cyrus, that was Darius. So what happened to Daniel between Cyrus and Cambyses onto Darius? Well, we don't know. But the story isn't about them, so why mention them? So in other words, Darius became king eventually. We're going to go ahead and skip all the other two kings because it doesn't really matter for the story. So anyways, when Darius became king, does that kind of make sense? I think that's the most natural reading of it, but once again, you don't have to take my view for it. Maybe you have a better view. That's totally fine. Or maybe you agree with one of the other uh, ideas that people have come up with. That's totally fine, too. Um, so then that takes us to a little issue with Ezra. Now, these four books really kind of uh, collate. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Daniel. Okay. So basically, Daniel chronologically begins first, but then it kind of it kind of covers a lot of a lot of territory. Daniel goes; it starts first and it goes, and then before Daniel ends, the book of Ezra technically begins. And then between Ezra and Nehemiah is Esther, but Nehemiah finishes up what Ezra starts. So. Let me try and kind of put this differently. Ezra and Nehemiah are like one book. They're separated into two different books, Ezra and Nehemiah, but they're kind of like one. In fact, in the Jewish canon, they're, they're seen as one unit. So, and then Esther happens kind of just somewhere in the, right in the middle of those two books. And then Daniel is like the prelude to those books, if that makes sense. You, you kind of have to read them and get acquainted with them, but long story short, Ezra has a little bit of a chronological problem that we need to look at. Um, because some people say, aha, it's not true. Once again, it seems like just rushing too quickly to say that something's not true. You know, if, if your if first instinct is to say, aha, this is not true, it's stupid, I can disprove it, stop for a second and maybe think about what the person's actually saying, because you might be going into it with this idea instead. I have all the answers. I have already, you know, I mean, everybody else is stupid because they're not as smart as me. Just maybe yeah. stop for a second and, and think about it. Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses, how, uh, houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Um, so then that takes us to verse 4 through 7. Uh, then the people of the land discourage. They say, "No, you know, we're not going to do that." So, verse four. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. So they went from, "Hey, can we help you?" to, "Hey, we don't want you to do this." <laughs> wow. Um, and it may, makes you think that maybe their intentions weren't totally honorable when they offered to help. Maybe, especially since it says that the enemies of Israel offered to help. Kind of makes you think that maybe they had alternate ideas of... Anyways, <laughs> right? <laughs> then the people of the land discouraged the people of, of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purposes. All the days... Now, now that's what happened then. But now it's going to give a sweeping statement, okay? All the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So this is what's happening between that part in Daniel when, when it skips over Cyrus and Cambyses. This is happening back in uh, Israel. They're trying to start rebuilding. They're facing a lot of opposition. D Daniel is over back in Babylon. Okay. Um, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, so now we're skipping forward, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an, accusing, an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. 
in the days of Artaxerxes, now we're hopping again another king. Okay, another king down the line. Bishlam and Mithridath and Tabil and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. Um, so once again, there the official documents were written in what language? Aramaic. Which means that if Daniel has parts in Aramaic, this might be proof of its authenticity, right? Doesn't this make sense? <laughs> okay, I thought it made sense. Um, so then, uh, so then we can safely uh, kind of. Uh, separate this part that we read into a few different sections. Well, let me... Wait, no, did I? Oh, and then verses 23 and 24. Uh, then when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. That's the problem right there. You just said that... It was King Artaxerxes that stopped the building, but now you're saying that it stopped it all the way until King Darius, but King Darius reigned before. So we have a chronological problem. Well, once again, this isn't another example of people overcomplicating a very simple issue. You can basically take um, Daniel 4, I mean, sorry, Ezra uh, 4, 5, and then skip to verse 24, and that's in chronological order what happened, okay? So I'll read it to you. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. That's chronologically what happened. However, the writer of Ezra wants to show you that there was a pattern of persecution that happened that discouraged them for year after year that they were facing problem after problem after problem. So this is how he does it. Okay, this is the stuff that's happening. Wait. And this is the stuff that happened way after, and now let's go back to the story. Okay, So it looks something like this. This is the setup, verses 1 through 5. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the, and that the return, hey, can we help you? Um, no, you cannot. Then the people of the land discouraged them. They, hide, they bribed counselors against them. From all the, day, all the days of King Cyrus, who is the one who let them go back in the first place to rebuild, all the way down to Darius. So that's when they were having those specific problems. Now... After King Darius, they wrote a there was another king, Ahasuerus. They wrote him a letter. That didn't really get anywhere. So then there was another king, King Artaxerxes. They wrote another letter to him, and he did stop the building. But at that time, the building that he was stopping wasn't the temple because the temple was finished. He stopped the rebuilding of the walls. Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah talks about that. Um, Nehemiah is actually working for Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes says, Why are you upset? And he says, how can I be happy when, when this place, when, when my people are scattered, the city is in ruins, it's just terrible. And he's like, you know, I just wrote a letter about this. Like, just, just a couple years ago, I wrote a letter telling them to stop. Why don't you go ahead and go, and you'll take care of that. And so then Nehemiah goes back, and he takes letters to all of the people who had stopped the work, because Artaxerxes said stop. So he takes letters to them, he gives, he gives them all letters, and he proceeds to, to guide the people in building the, building the wall, and they, they finished it in record time. Um, anyways, so here we have the setup up till verse 5. Then we get to verse 6, which is a flash forward of the persecution that would happen. In the reign of Ahasuerus, they wrote the letter. In the days of Artaxerxes, they wrote the letter. Artaxerxes built the, built the um, stop to the work. And then verse 24 is, let's go back to the present. Now that you understand what happens in the future with, our, with these people just being a pain in our butt year after year, let's get back. Then the work in the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of of uh, uh, reign of Darius king of Persia. So let's see if I put this on here. Um, and then it picks up in, Dan in, in Ezra chapter 5. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah, which are the same Haggai and Zechariah that we have the books of, who prophesied to them to help them to start rebuilding again, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Jehozadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So this is before Artaxerxes, before Ahasuerus, uh, that is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with him supporting them. At the same time, Tetanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish the structure? Then, and then they also asked them this, what are the names of the men who are building this building? We're going to report you to the governor. 
Just, I'm, just, I'm joking. That's, that's a joke. <laughs> but the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. So they write this letter to him, uh, and then in 6, 1 through 3, uh, it says Darius made the decree. Search, he searched in Babylon. He found the record that set, that, of Cyrus saying, hey, yeah, they can go back and rebuild. And he says, hey, yeah, Cyrus wrote this. He said that they could rebuild, so leave him alone. Um, so, okay. They did stop the wall from being built later um, in the days of Artaxerxes, but uh, um, but then when Nehemiah came, the, it, it resumed back again, and that story is in Nehemiah. It, it picks up in chapter 2. Uh, it says, In the month uh, of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it up to the king. Now I had not been sad before in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the palace by my, of my father's graves, lives in ruins? And its gates have been destroyed by fire. So that that takes us to that. And uh, so the temple was only delayed. The wall and the rest of the city was actually stopped. But that was at a later time. See what happened is they went back. They were all they were all ready and giddy to get going. Well, then they started facing opposition. They're like, oh well, I guess we'll just live in our shanties. Well, then the prophets are like, you know, you're living in your little shanties, and meanwhile, the temple is still left in ruins. What are you doing? So they, they, they start rebuilding um, because nobody told them to stop. They just got discouraged. So then um, as they're rebuilding, they're like, who said you could do this? We're going to ask Darius. And so then Darius is like, well, let's look in the record. So he looks and says, okay, yeah, Cyrus said they could do that. Go ahead. And uh, so then they keep, they keep building, and they're living, and they're doing that thing. And then the next king, Ahasuerus, comes and they're like, well, these Jews. And Ahasuerus is like, yeah, whatever. And then Artaxerxes reigns, and, and he's like, these Jews! And so they're like, okay, yeah, fine, make them stop, because they, they have been rebellious in the past. And then Nehemiah is, all, Nehemiah is like, look at this, this is terrible. He's like, okay, yeah, you can go ahead and go finish it. Um, so that, 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 is the, that, is the, that is the history there. Okay, so Ezra is obviously not concerned about having everything in the order of events. He wants you to get the sweeping picture of what's happening. Because if you don't get that sweeping picture, you're going to think, oh, it wasn't that bad. Well, we're talking about year after year after year. It starts to get to you. So there's Cyrus. That's the one who gave them the decree to go back. However, they didn't finish. Cambyses didn't finish. Darius, but at this point, they weren't even working on the temple. And so then they, the prophets told them to rebuild it. They, they did. Still facing opposition, Xerxes, who's, who's known as Ahasuerus and Daniel, or in Ezra, um, uh, they write him a letter that doesn't really go anywhere. Then, then Artaxerxes, this is the guy that Nehemiah works for. This is the guy that told them to stop, and this is the guy that told them they could continue. So, just remember that. The, the chronology may look like it's a mess, but it's really not as bad as, as people make it out to be. It's just that they don't stop and read it. They, they just kind of gloss over it, looking for something to pick apart, and then they say, ah, 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 I found something. So, uh, I hope that that kind of clarifies that. Um, we'll, we'll keep on looking at the time of the exile and the time of the prophets. There's, there's quite a few things we need to look at. Um, some things that seem not true, that seem to kind of contradict what archaeology has shown us. So we'll, we'll look at those things um, and, and we'll continue on with next week with the time of the exile and, and also looking at the prophets. Are there any questions? No? We're all good? <laughs> so we're good? You didn't know? Have, oh, have you ever read the book? I'm sure I have. Well, it says it says he in the book. I just I guess I just always assume because I